Good afternoon, everybody. We are very pleased to uh, have you uh, for the second uh, webinar series on the Water Energy Food Nexus. Uh, we already had uh, last uh, two weeks ago an uh, introductory session that just uh, introduced the concepts and uh, the tools. And today we are going to dive in further in the tools and methods. And I will give the floor to Annette Huberly from the Stockholm Environmental uh, Institute to just take you through the session we are having today. And uh, before I forget, so this um, uh, session is organized in the framework of uh, the project called Implementing the 2030 Agenda on Efficiency, Productivity and Sustainability of Water in the Near East and North Africa region that is summarized uh, on your screen <laughs> on the right. Um, so uh, Annette, please. Yeah, thank you, Damatia. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and to welcome those of you who joined us for the first in this series last two weeks ago. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to focus a little bit more deeply on um, tools and methods to identify Nexus solutions. If you recall, two weeks ago, we really focused on more the identification of Nexus challenges. Today, we're going to talk much more about uh, finding solutions. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce sort of three of my colleagues. Um, Francesco Fusanarini from uh, KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. My colleague, Brian Joyce, who works with me in the Stockholm Environment Institute. And Camilo Ramirez Gomez, who is also with the KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. So I'd just like to remind everybody the broader series objectives are really to deepen our collective understanding of the water energy food nexus and, and how do we think about identifying challenges and solutions, recognizing that not every intersection between water, food and energy is something we need to, um, <clears throat> is, is a concern, right? It's identifying where the intersections occur and what kind of method and tool do we need to use when it's problematic in terms of policies that are going in different directions and really looking at case studies. So we focused, um, last webinar series focused on the MENA region. Today we'll focus more deeply on Jordan and Morocco. Um, but as you'll see throughout the series, we'll be referring a broader set of contexts with next week or two weeks from now, we'll be focusing on um, the case of Lebanon, really a deeper dive on the role of diets and food security and its connection to water scarcity. Um, and then we have the pleasure of learning more about both North Africa, West Africa, and then again, a deeper dive into Jordan and Morocco in terms of understanding complex results, uh, looking at climate change and other deep uncertainties. And while we don't have it up here, I believe the following, well, one more, at least one more um, webinar series, possibly more, but one that will be focusing on Iran. And so with this, I'd like to hand over to Francesco, but I just want to add one more thing, which is um, today, last time we didn't leave a lot of time for uh, questions. And we're gonna, when we finish our presentation side, we're gonna go directly to questions. So may I ask that you please write questions along the way in the chat box and we'll have a Q&A session before we do a, a breakout room. And one question that came up last time that you'll hear much more about was around how are we in our methodology taking into account uh, climate change, future scenarios. And so scenarios will feature largely today. So I hope we get a chance to address the question that was asked last time in today's session. So over to you, Francesco. Um, thank you, Annette, and thank you everyone for joining and FAO for hosting this webinar. Um, so yeah, as, as Annette introduced, uh, we restart from what we did in the last webinar, where we introduced the concepts of Nexus challenges, which are intuitively challenges that are present across the energy, 
water and, and land sectors and, and other sectors potentially, but here we focus on, on those three. Uh, and uh, from that, we look at solutions to uh, address those challenges, uh, both in qualitative terms. So how do we identify the type of solutions and how we categorize them? Uh, but also then in terms of tools, once we find certain solutions that we want to investigate more in depth, how do we understand in detail how they would perform uh, through dedicated modeling and scenario analysis? Uh, the depending on the time that we have after the question and answer section, we will also have uh, some uh, uh, either group work or individual work on Nexus solutions. So yeah. Uh, getting started on Nexus solutions. Uh, just to remind, uh, this, is, this slide shows just a simple example of a Nexus challenge. Uh, this is an example that is common in many countries, especially in water scarce area. Uh, but uh, for instance, a common regional case in the Nina region are possibly uh, water scarcity issues. They can be caused by a variety of cases. In some countries, for instance, there might be inefficiencies in the water system. So not all the water that is available in the system is uh, delivered, but there are some inefficiencies due to losses of the systems, due to illegal connections and so on. And this coexists and uh, um, contribute to water scarcity. So this is a water issue, but when we see it with the Nexus lens, there are a variety of implications across all sectors. And here we provide a few examples. So for instance, when we have uh, water scarcity, the water table uh, might become more deep. So you need more energy for pumping, uh, pumping up the water. Uh, and in case water scarcity becomes really uh, an issue to the, to the point where there is not enough water in the system for certain uses, you might have to use desalination. And as you know, desalination is a very energy intensive process. So you do require a lot of electricity or other source of energy to uh, take out uh, sal salinity from, from water to, to, to have it usable. There are also implications on the land and food uh, domains. So water scarcity can result in reduced uh, food production. Uh, and of course, issues around uh, water, water tables can have impacts on uh, uh, ecosystems, both terrestrial, but also marine. So this is a typical challenge. Of course, uh, in this slide is quite simplified, uh, but what we want to focus today is on uh, solutions to address these challenges. And so, for instance, if we think at this specific challenge, one could think at the, in the same type of way about possible solutions. So, for instance, one could uh, look at how to increase oper operation and maintenance of the water system or replace, replace some equipment that would, uh, in turn, reduce the losses of water in the system. Then, of course, such a solution that is uh, uh, the starts in the water sector also results in decreased energy needs for pumping water because the water situation improves, but also you need less water being more efficient. And then, of course, this become, results in more, more, more water being available for agriculture. Uh, ecosystems then in turn have benefits from this type of, of, uh, of interventions. And also one could think of other solutions to, uh, to try to uh, improve these types of situations. And one that uh, we will also explore uh, in this webinar a bit more in detail uh, is uh, looking at solar pumping uh, to uh, replace other sources of uh, energy for pumping, such as butane or diesel. So this is just an example of one type of solutions, but there are many types of solutions across different domains on how to address Nexus challenges. Uh, and the UNEC, uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, have worked with uh, multiple stakeholders, including uh, as a KTH, uh, in uh, trying to categorize the type of solutions that are out there. 
Um, and uh, basically, as a result of that research, uh, this categorization of solution was uh, produced. This is not set in stone. Uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly that uh, one solution fits only one of these boxes. But this is a very useful way to look at uh, uh, which type of solutions are available and also to provide some examples now. So this is the so-called five I's. So solutions are categorized in institution, information, international cooperation, instruments, and infrastructures. So I'll, I'll provide a few examples for each one of these five I's. So there are various possible ways to support Nexus work across institutions. So for instance, if one wants to coordinate uh, the work on instit uh, institutional work on uh, water, energy, and food. One could try to clarify the roles and responsibilities of the different, let's say, ministries. One could set up a mechanism to coordinate across the sectors. And there are a variety of examples to do this. For instance, one of the ministry could take a bit more of a role for the sectorial coordination, or there might be, as there are in many countries, multidisciplinary teams. So let's say, each of the ministries of water, energy, uh, land, but even environment, climate change, or, or finance, they might appoint a couple of people that they meet and coordinate on the nexus. And of course, uh, all of this is to ensure coherence between sectoral strategies. So this was the first I. The second I is information. So how do we improve accessibility of data and availability of data about this kind of nexus challenges. And this is not trivial. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to act on something that you cannot understand and monitor. So of course, monitoring, uh, it's very key across the sectors uh, with, for instance, selected indicators that uh, give information about this kind of cross-sectorial dynamics. And as you can understand, one needs to understand where the issues are by collecting relevant data across the water, energy, and food sectors. Uh, another set of work in this, uh, uh, in this uh, field could be to identify policy implementation barriers and improve knowledge of nexus challenges across sectors. And this is, of course, very crucial because uh, uh, many times um, different ministries, but a bit everywhere, even academia, we work, we can work in silos and one could have a, a perfect understanding of the energy system but a limited understanding of how the energy system impacts the water systems, the land systems and other systems. So improving knowledge of this kind of nexus uh, dynamics is, is really, really important. Then to address the nexus, there are a number of instruments that can be adopted to address nexus challenges. For instance, we, one could look at policies that work across sector for instance, giving incentives for coordinating across water, energy, and food sectors. Economic instruments, such as targeted tariffs on uh, energy, water, land uh, services, and products. And of course, also legal instruments, which, for instance, can be regulating the use of water resources across sectors. Uh, Another category of solution, I would say the one that we hear the most about usually is infrastructure and investments. So these are, uh, let's say, physical solutions to Nexus challenges. Uh, so we're talking about infrastructure projects such as uh, big desalination projects, dams, conveyance systems, transmission networks, and so on. And, so on. Uh, and of course, this also includes not only new infrastructure projects, but also how do we change existing infrastructure projects to optimize their use? Uh, and again, this is the one that usually is most discussed uh, around the Nexus, because these are projects that need uh, some uh, plans, need some uh, uh, blueprints, uh, modeling to really understand what they mean. Uh, but of course, all these others that I'm explaining are as important as both supporting and to uh, supporting these infrastructure projects, but also to understand how to make these infrastructure projects uh, successful. And then in some cases, so in the cases where 
uh, more countries are involved uh, in decisions around the nexus. International coordination and cooperation is really key. Uh, so in some cases, one needs to look across boundaries uh, to solve nexus issues. So in the first webinar, my colleague uh, Youssef Almullah uh, introduced the case of the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer, where different countries had to work together to harmonize their use of water energy and agricultural land across boundaries. So to address these kind of issues, one could uh, start looking at common interests for regional development, uh, looking at how to facilitate and optimize trade for water, electricity, and, and, other, and other services, and so on. So uh, just as an example uh, from, uh, uh, and sorry, I think uh, there is one uh, microphone that is on. Uh, can you please mute yourself? from one of the participants. Uh, thank you, in the meantime, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, but uh, yeah, going back to the example that I, that I started with, uh, let's say the very simplified example of uh, inefficiencies in the water system and uh, combined with uh, water scarcity, which type of nexus solutions we could look at uh, for addressing that specific challenge? So, uh, here again, uh, we, we, we don't have much time. Of course, there are many more examples for each one of these boxes, but just to start providing some concrete examples. So for institutions, how could one address this? One could look at uh, uh, improving the cooperation between uh, maybe the water and energy institutions to define a plan of energy efficiency and renewables in the water system. If we look at information, what could we do? We could uh, look at automating the water system operation we could look at training uh, for operation and maintenance of personnel for reducing the inefficiencies and the water loss in the systems. If we look at instruments, uh, we could look at, uh, so which laws, how, how could we enforce laws against illegal wells and, uh, sorry, wells and uh, illegal uh, water um, use? Uh, but also, how could we improve collection efficiency through performance-based contracting? And finally, of course, infrastructure. So how we can uh, enhance uh, the existing equipment, how can we uh, introduce decentralized wastewater management? And uh, here are another couple of examples, which uh, today we will look a bit more in detail for the examples of uh, Jordan and Morocco. How can we use, for instance, solar PV for water pumping? And how, how, what will be the effect of large desalination projects across these systems? Um, so I'll, I'll jump through, uh, I'll jump to the uh, examples that we had in, in these specific projects with, uh, uh, with UNFO uh, for uh, the case studies of Jordan and Morocco. And uh, uh, when we talk about finding nexus solutions, there are various steps. And the first one is to have a dialogue across sectors to find solutions to the nexus challenges. Um, so again, in, in the previous workshop, we looked uh, for Jordan and Morocco, which nexus challenges we identified through participatory processes with the local stakeholders. Today, we're looking at how in uh, follow-up workshops and meetings, we started brainstorming and identifying the solutions to those challenges in these countries. So as we said the last time, uh, these types of meetings and dialogues, it's, it's really necessary to have a uh, uh, representative from water, energy, land, and environmental sectors. And sometimes even more uh, in, in some of these meetings, we have also representative from uh, the financial sectors and so on. So let's say the initial processes are qualitative, let's say. So for instance, here in Jordan, uh, after discussing and investigating and adding details to the challenges, we then worked in groups to try to identify and brainstorm of possible solutions to those challenges. And here, as you can say, we work to categorize those in the same uh, um, taxonomy, in the same way that I just described. So through information, infrastructure, institutional cooperation and instruments. Um, 
And this was very valuable. So, and here just uh, uh, there are some of the examples of the Nexus solutions that were identified in these participatory processes. Um, and some of the key solutions that are, were then identified in a, let's say, quantitative, uh, sorry, qualitative way are now being investigated with tailored qualitative methods. So for instance, here you see uh, infrastructure solutions such as desalination projects, wastewater reuse and dumps are now being investigated through the projects with models and quantitative methods to understand their effect and feasibility. And uh, Brian and Camillo, my colleagues, will expand on those examples in just a few minutes. Um, but at the same time, not only the infrastructure, we, we are investigating not only the infrastructure, physical changes to these systems, but also how all other solutions across institutions, information, instruments can be used to support um, these different scenarios of development across these sectors. Um, and I'll not go in detail here, but also to have you noted that in this kind of workshop, we also try to understand uh, which solutions the stakeholders deem as most important. And, and then the ones that are most important are then prioritized for the work on scenarios development and modeling. So just to mention uh, a similar process was done for the Morocco case where we are working in the Sous Massa region. Um, in the same way, uh, these exercises are particip participatory with representative from all involved sector and aim at really understanding which type of solutions could be, um, could be used to address Nexus challenges. For Morocco, again, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go in detail in all the types of solutions, but again, there was a really large variety of solutions that were proposed, uh, but uh, some examples here are improving the efficiency of the irrigation system, the rationalization of water use, looking at desalination projects, uh, but also looking at how to improve the water uh, table level uh, with the um, control over drilling of wells, and of course, improving the coordination between different stakeholders. Um, so now uh, I'll uh, pass the word to uh, my colleagues, but uh, I, will let, I would like just to flag that uh, in all these cases, starting from the qualitative work of understanding what are the Nexus challenges and potential, sol potential solutions in those challenges in an area of or, or country, in-depth work is needed to understand the feasibility and effect of Nexus solutions to address Nexus challenges. And to do that, again, detailed modeling and quantitative work is needed to compare different scenarios of development across Nexus sectors. There are a variety of modeling approaches that are available in international and academic work to do this. And uh, well, now my colleague and uh, my colleagues, Brian Joyce and Camilo uh, Ramirez Gomez will expand on the modeling that is being done and has been done to investigate Nexus solutions in Jordan and Morocco. Uh, for this project. So, uh, Brian, when you want, the, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Francesco. Yes, as uh, Francesco mentioned, my name is Brian Joyce from SEI, and I, together with Camilo, uh, will present the, the tools that, that were developed uh, as part of this project to look at the, the nexus in Jordan and Morocco. So if we can uh, advance to the next slide. So, Generally, in this diagram is showing uh, the, a, a general approach for considering the linkages between the water, energy, and food sectors with the uh, representation of the water system on the left in blue. <clears throat> and on the right-hand side of this diagram in red shows the, the, the energy system. And in between, uh, we, we can see the linkages between them, the, the drivers for, for water and energy demands, such as agriculture. In, in agriculture, we have different water use patterns. Uh, you may be pumping groundwater or diverting for surface water. And in the extent to which uh, that you're, you're pumping or, or dividing, diverting water 
will affect the availability of water throughout the, the, the water system. Um, and it will also have impacts on, on the energy system. If you're pumping more groundwater, presumably you're also using more energy. Uh, similarly, if we're looking at desalination, we, it has a similar impact uh, both on the water system where more desalination is going to uh, free up more water in other parts of the water system. And uh, as, as Francesco already mentioned, desalination has, uh, comes at a, a quite a large energy cost. Um, so we, there are lots of drivers like this, including wastewater treatment, um, would have similar impacts. Uh, as population is changing, um, the, the demands for, for water are increasing, the, uh, the patterns of water usage are, are changing, and that also has uh, linkages back to the, the energy system. So going forward, uh, more specifically, it, in our case studies in Morocco and Jordan, um, we developed tools to, to consider these linked systems using uh, a, a variety of data inputs. So there are GIS inputs that, that go into informing these models as well as tabular data. And all of this information was, was uh, collected and combined uh, to create representations of the, the energy and the food and, and water systems uh, to first create a, a baseline uh, situation that, that describes or a quanti as, as a quantitative representation of the, the existing condition uh, in, in Jordan and in Morocco. And from that baseline, then we can uh, conduct scenario analysis to look at different uh, management strategies or to look at different policies. Uh, we can also conduct sensitivity analysis that looks at different levels of, say, groundwater pumping or surface water pumping or adding desalination to different levels and look at the, the impacts both on the, the water side, the energy and, and food sides. We go forward. <clears throat> So I'm going to present the, the water and energy tool, or sorry, the water and agricultural tool that we developed, and then I'll pass it to my colleague Camilo, who will uh, describe the, the energy tool. In the, for water and food, what we used was something called the water evaluation and planning, or the WEEP tool. And I'll just describe this in general terms. It's a, a generic water resources management model, which is that it, it, it can be applied and has been applied in a variety of settings um, in basins in, in countries around the world. Um, and essentially what this model does is that it uses uh, a collection of objects to describe the, the water supply situation and the water demand situation uh, where you can have competing demands for a limited water supply and we look at different scenarios that seek to, to balance the water supplies, the distribution of, of water to the various demands uh, in the most equitable way uh, possible. Uh, so if we advance. So the, the WEEP model was, is used to, to represent uh, in, our, in this case, both the, the water uh, system as well as the agricultural system. And we can do that because it is an integrated tool it considers both the natural and human systems. Uh, the diagram here will sh shows the, the natural system is uh, a full accounting of the, the hydrology or the water flows throughout the basin, beginning with precipitation and how much that, of that precipitation runs off to uh, surface waters or recharges the groundwater or is lost back to the atmosphere. On top of that, um, we can add different uh, infrastructure or, or demands that are nested within the, these underlying hydrological processes. So on the agricultural side, we consider uh, rain-fed or irrigated agriculture uh, in our case, and uh, the, the crops that are grown, uh, the, the infrastructure that's in place, including the, the diversions or the groundwater pumping, uh, that extracts water and delivers it to, to agriculture. 
Um, we can have urban demands that are taking water out of reservoirs that are on the rivers. Uh, we can also include uh, environmental demands or to keep water in, in the, the rivers. So if advance. So to give just a general sense of what these, the, the, the WEEP models in these two cases look like, the level of detail uh, that, or level of disaggregation that we use to represent these, these two case studies, I just present here uh, these two screen captures that show a collection of these, as I mentioned, the, the objects that's uh, GIS based that we can add uh, all the surface water and the groundwater features to, to uh, quantify the, the water supplies. And then we also include the different demands for uh, agriculture and, uh, and urban demands as well. So in Jordan, um, we, as Francesco mentioned, we had a series of workshops where we worked with stakeholders to uh, collect, date, collect information and, and discuss with them the different strategies that we would like to consider in looking in, at the, the nexus of water and energy and food and looking at different strategies to, uh, to manage the, these interconnections. So some of the strategies that emerged from these discussions included uh, the addition of new water supplies. So one large project that's been under discussion for some time is the, the Red Sea, the Dead Sea project, which we will um, present here. Other scenarios that we considered were looking at increased water productivity in agriculture. So uh, less water for uh, the increased crop per drop, I guess you could say. And uh, others were reducing the, the leakage or the non-revenue water within the water distribution system and increasing energy efficiency for, for water pumping. So the, the, the Red Dead project, uh, as many of you may be aware, it is the, on the left-hand side of this, we, we can see the, the, the basic components of, the, of this project. Uh, it's quite a large project that includes taking water from the Red Sea uh, and uh, moving that north towards the, the large urban center in Amman and desalinating that water and the brine from that water would then, some of that would be diverted to the Dead Sea in an effort to try to recover water levels there. Um, and the desalinated water would then be used to, to meet uh, growing demands. And uh, the, the, the graphic here shows uh, how we, we considered the, uh, the implementation of this project over time out into the year to the year 2050. So it uh, presumably in this scenario would come online somewhere around uh, the year 2025 and increase its capacity uh, moving forward and uh, at, at look at just out to the year 2050. So the, the WEEP model, as I mentioned before, it includes a collection of these different representations for water supplies and demands. We're considering a variety of different water sectors uh, and irrigated agriculture as well. And the, the, those demands are getting water from a, a, a variety of, of groundwater or, water, or surface water sources. So for in the case of the, the Red Dead project, we would uh, consider it adding a desalination plant down along the Red Sea in the south and pumping that water north through a system of pipelines uh, towards, towards Amman. So with that, I will pass uh, to my colleague, Camilo. Okay, hey, thank you, Ryan. Okay, so um, moving on, um, based on, on, on the outputs that we get from this hydrological model, uh, we are now we do now need to be able to estimate where the different energy needs uh, in the country for supplying these water resources. So this uh, basically includes groundwater uh, pumping energy, surface water conveyance energy, desalination energy, 
and wastewater energy uh, for treatment. So basically for the energy model, what we do is that we start from the outputs of WIP, which will tell us uh, where are all of the where are all the different uh, water flows throughout the different systems. So how much water is being extracted, how much is being conveyed, uh, how much is being supplied for each different uh, supply point. And we couple these with some different technical specifications of the systems. So meaning some uh, technical specifications for the conveyance system, all of the different water network, uh, for the salination system, wastewater treatment system, and so on. And then we selected some uh, targeted uh, geospatial input layers and analysis methodologies to be able to account for these different energy uses. This was selected as uh, a, a lot of these different parameters changes, especially. Um, so for example, we could use different groundwater depth maps to be able to account for the uh, water table levels of the aquifers and the extraction points and the different changes in times based on what the the water balance model in WIP tell us. Then also taking into, uh, into account the complexity of the water network system in Jordan, which as uh, Brian said, spreads through all the country from south to north and, and serves different uh, demand points and takes water from different supply points. We are able to account for uh, what's the energy required for conveyance from point to point the, based on the on the distance and the elevation differences and accounting for technical specifications of the pipelines. Then specifically for the desalination scenario that we are analyzing, we take into account the location of point A from the water is being sourced. So basically uh, the seawater that is being uh, captured, uh, desalinated and conveying up to point B in north of the country to be able to supply demand to municipality and agricultural sectors. So moving from this, uh, now we are able to, to see some preliminary results. This is still an ongoing project, but this is for um, visualization purposes of these different nexus dynamics. So based on the participatory approach that we conducted throughout the, the project, uh, we are able to ask some questions to try to answer some of the challenges and, and, and assess the different solutions that we are trying to to implement. So one question would be how this project could aid into reducing water scarcity. So the estimations of the model results basically tell us that the overall water deliveries could increase on average by 4.3% annually. And this will um, relate to a decrease in unmet demand of an average of 6.5% annually, as we can see in the plot of the right. So this unmet demand what tell us is basically what is the percentage of water that is theoretically or technically required by each sector, but is not being supplied due to water unavailability or water scarcity. So as we see in Jordan, uh, we still have a high uh, percentage of, of unmet water demand, but we see that this project has a um, um, substantial effect, especially on the municipality level, improving uh, substantially this unmet demand in the municipality consumption. Then if we analyze further the system, um, we are able to, to see how this relates or how this affects the energy sector. What are the additional energy requirements? So the estimations of the model uh, tell us that the energy for desalination would be around 355 gigawatt hour annually and extra energy for conveyance around 1,896 gigawatt hour annually. This is a substantial amount of extra energy. And as we can see here in the plot of the left, which is uh, the results for the desalination scenario, and the plot uh, of the right is basically the business as usual. So if, if the trend, ongoing trend that we have now continues, uh, it looks something like this. And we see that when the project comes full operational in the year 2029, we see a, a huge increase in energy requirements, which basically doubles the current amount of energy needs in the, in the, for, for water purposes. This is especially important in the context of Jordan, as uh, all, most of the energy sources in Jordan are being imported and are uh, 
fossil fuel based, mainly fossil fuel based. So this has both uh, consequences on uh, the environment and energy security or energy independence, sorry, of the country. So uh, this is not to say that this is a, a, a problem with the project uh, as this is an extra solution. Basically what needs to be accounted is holistic solutions that take into account these extra energy needs and targets uh, sustainable solutions to be able to supply these energy requirements. Uh, so for example, couple, couple this desalination solution with some modern uh, sources of energy, uh, which could uh, both um, uh, help the environment and improve the energy independence of the country. Now, uh, we are uh, move on to the Susmasa uh, Moroccan case. Uh, we want to talk about uh, some scenarios that we analyzed there and uh, uh, analyze in a specific scenario. So I pass back to my colleague Brian to give the introduction. Yeah, thank you, Camilo. So uh, similar to the, the process that we had in Jordan, in Morocco, we also had a series of workshops with stakeholders to, to collect from them information about the system and to discuss with them uh, different strategies and scenarios that we should consider in evaluating the nexus. So in, in this case, we have uh, some, some similar strategies that were discussed. So starting with new water supplies, in this case, a desalination plant that is uh, to be built along the Atlantic coast and, and near Agadir. Um, wastewater reuse in agriculture is another strategy that was of high interest in the basin. Uh, also increasing water productivity in agriculture and in, in our case in Morocco, looking at solar PV adoption in agriculture in the phase out of butane. So let's consider the, the, uh, the addition of new water supply from desalination at Agadir. This is, as I mentioned, a new desalination plant that would augment supplies just along the coast for, for urban demands in Agadir and for coastal irrigated agriculture. And the, the, the graphic here shows how this is scheduled to be phased in over time uh, in two different phases, an initial phase that will provide uh, some level of water to the region and that will is expected to be expanded uh, at a, a future uh, second phase. So similar to what we did in, in Jordan in developing the WEEP model in Morocco, we used a collection of these water demands, uh, uh, objects to consider residential demands as well as agricultural demands. Uh, it, it, in this case, we're looking at uh, water delivered to agriculture at the level of irrigation districts or perimeter irrigation perimeters. Um, whereas in Jordan, we were looking at a, a somewhat larger scale. And uh, for the purposes of the scenarios that we considered here, uh, adding desalin a desalination project along the coast that's, that's delivering water to Agadir and to a couple of these irrigation perimeters just along the coast. And in considering the uh, another scenario for wastewater reuse in agriculture, we looked at the extent to which the uh, uh, residential demands can take water that has been treated after use there and then applied to uh, local irrigation uh, perimeters to the distribution network. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, so uh, now uh, similarly as in the Jordan case, uh, to be able to account for the different energy requirements uh, in the Susmasa region in Morocco, we start or, or draw from the WIP uh, outputs. Uh, so this water balance and agricultural balance model. Uh, then coupled with technical specifications, some GIS input parameters, groundwater maps, elevation difference maps, uh, supply points, uh, demand points, desalination projects, and so on. And then we're able to estimate the different energy needs and uh, um, explore different scenarios. 
So uh, taking a look into some preliminary results for the Morocco case, uh, we can do the same. And based on the participatory approach that was uh, undertaken there, uh, we can start asking some questions to be able to answer some of the challenges and, and how these solutions could aid in the, in the different uh, um, questions uh, that were raised in the in the workshops. So what will be how this how desalination, uh, how wastewater reuse could re reduce water scarcity in the region. So some results uh, basically tell us that around 30.65 million cubic meters of filtered wastewater could be reused in agriculture annually. And around 44 million cubic meters of groundwater could be saved annually due to this uh, um, solution. Then this will all um, translate into water deliveries being increased in average by 5.3% annually. So if we analyze the, the plots here uh, below, basically the, the ones on the left with the purple circle are the, the ones with the solution of desalination plus wastewater reuse. And the ones on the right with the red circle are the ones with the business as social case. So without any desalination or wastewater reuse. And we see that uh, in water and delivery terms, uh, uh, we see a substantial increase on deliveries, uh, mainly by the end of the period, let's say half end of the period. Uh, and this, uh, translate translates most into alleviating the groundwater resources. As we can see here, uh, the main reduction of, of water being uh, used as is from the groundwater resources and is being um, replaced by desalination and some reuse of wastewater. If we further analyze this, we can ask ourselves how this could help or aid in the restoration of groundwater aquifers and help um, agricultural productive production. So the results tell us that the Shutuka aquifer uh, could be the, the aquifer that would be most uh, substantially benefited by this measure. As we can see here in the business as social scenarios, uh, this aquifer is seeing a drawdown, constant drawdown uh, throughout the entire period. And this will entail in the future that less water will be available for agriculture, which will uh, translate into a low production of, of crops in the future. If we implement this measure, then we see that a uh, uh, substantial recovery of the water table levels in the aquifer could be achieved. And then uh, this will aid directly the production in agriculture. Moreover, uh, then we analyze what will be the additional energy requirements, similarly to the Jordan case. And we see desalination will uh, require around 402 gigawatt hour annually, conveyance around 182.8 gigawatt annually. This number, although substantial, is much less than the one that we saw in the Jordan case. And this is mainly due uh, to the characteristics of the project in Morocco. As uh, the desalination project is, uh, as well from a, from a, of a um, uh, similar uh, capacity or, 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 or as well big, but the water is being uh, delivered or conveyed to coastal zones, which are not that uh, far away from the desalination plant as opposed to the Jordan case. So this conveyance energy is much less in this, in this case. Then we see that for wastewater treatment, uh, it's requiring 26 gigawatt hour annually. And this is uh, much less than for desalination, which is logical as uh, there's a much less wastewater um, uh, resource to be reused. But in general terms, the wastewater treatment energy requirement is or intensity is much lower than the intensity of the desalination processes. And also has some additional characteristics as it can be a much more decentralized systems as the desalination one. As you have a big desalination plant and you supply to some points, but with the wastewater treatment, you can have several wastewater treatment, uh, uh, let's say closer to the to the supply of the wastewater points and try to supply to close uh, demand sites, for example, in agriculture. So we see from the results that the extra energy requirements are substantial. They more than double the current energy requirements. And similar to the Jordan case, they will, this will uh, need to be coupled with sustainable uh, energy sources and modern systems. So the environmental impacts are not uh, high or are diminished and uh, uh, they can also achieve uh, energy security and independence. 
Moreover, uh, we analyze some scenarios into how um, uh, uh, can be decarbonized the agricultural sector. So currently in the Sosmaja Massa region, uh, butane is still used as uh, a fuel in, in the agricultural sector for some activities and also pumping. And this entails some inefficient pumping and high emissions. Um, with the additional characteristics as uh, the butane is highly sub subsidized in the region currently. So we explore several scenarios into what phasing out butane and adopting PV systems would mean. And the, we analyze different levels. So the business as usual scenario where no phase out is taken, a phase out by year 2040, an earlier phase out by year 2030. And then we couple this with three different levels of PV adoption. Uh, in agriculture, PV pumping adoption by year 2040, 10%, 20%, and 50% shares. Some preliminary results uh, already tell us some uh, interesting dynamics. So um, in here, if we analyze the worst case scenario, which will be this point uh, uh, here on the right, uh, it's telling us that uh, by the size of the point that uh, around 10 per, with, with around 10% of PV adoption and not non-facing out butane, so doing nothing about butane, we will have uh, high emissions and high system total system costs. This total system cost is a measure which uh, takes into account all the different costs of the systems as operational costs, maintenance costs, uh, uh, capital investment costs, uh, fuel costs, and also uh, levels of subsidies. So. If we do the opposite and analyze the best case scenario, we see uh, with a high adoption of PV in the agricultural sector of around 50%, and an early first site fails out by year 2030, we obtain lower emissions and lower system costs. So this is quite interesting because this already gives us a, a, a powerful message. All right, let's see, let's see the long lay technique. Okay, sorry. So, it gives us an important message in which basically tells us that uh, implementing solutions to move away from fossil fuels uh, use and adopting modern uh, energy sources is often both cost beneficial and environmentally friendly. So uh, it's something important to take into account with when we analyze all of these different nexus aspects as often uh, moving forward for uh, modern energy and sustainable sources is actually better in terms of cost and for the environment. So after all this, um, we were thinking into a way of trying to close a bit the gap between uh, 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 quantitative modeling and the decision making. So how to provide a useful tool or how to make all of these insights useful for decision makers and, 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 and people uh, working in these uh, different uh, perspectives. So we are constructing some visualization platforms both for the Jordan case and the Moroccan case in which all of these different scenarios and assumptions can be explored. Uh, one could go and explore all a uh, uh, specific scenario that we model with the different assumptions, change some uh, um, values here and there, and see some custom uh, results uh, with, with different insights, uh, see some additional information about the assumptions embedded into the model that the different uh, scenarios run. Also, one could go and see a specific uh, results for uh, a specific point, for example, here in the Shituka Aquifer, uh, how the drawdown is changing, how the, the water supply is, is changing over time, where is this uh, aquifer supplying mainly to, to agricultural, domestic, and so on. And the same with all of the different uh, supply and, and demand points in the region. For example, one could go and see an agricultural site, how it's producing at a certain time. And we can even uh, summarize that uh, aggregated by uh, municipality or province and see how this pro province is uh, producing crops, is, is using water, and is requiring energy. Uh, all of the data embedded here will be uh, fully uh, available online, open access, and uh, one could go explore the models and even download all of the data that is embedded uh, in the results of the models and do further analysis. And yeah, with, with that, I uh, finish my intervention and I pass back to Francesco. 
Actually, I, I think uh, to me, Camilo, <laughs> if I could uh, take a few minutes and then direct some, some questions to the three of you who presented. Uh, Francesco, I'd like to start with you. <clears throat> Um, a question came up, to what extent are institutions, information, and instruments really solutions to nexus issues? They all uh, imply appropriate governance arrangements to be implemented in practice. Could you speak to that? Um, yeah, of course. Um, and, and again, I would like to flag that uh, none of those categories are set in stone. They're more like guidelines and... and uh, broad categories to, to help thinking across, yeah, Nexus solutions. Um, and I think I mentioned to address an issue. So can we build a large dam? Can we do some desalination project? Can we install PV? However, all those others uh, are equally as needed. So sometimes a simple uh, solution, uh, maybe with a change in legislation, with some tariffs, with some coordination across ministries could uh, solve uh, certain nexus challenges at a much lower cost. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if, if I answered the, the, the question, but that's the thinking across having all these different uh, boxes, let's say, to, to categorize these, these solutions. Thank you, Francesco, that's really helpful. Um, Brian, if I could direct a couple of WEEP related questions to you. Sure. Um, so the first question is, <clears throat> can you use WEEP to do trend analysis on rainfall variability and groundwater levels? And the second very interesting question, um, how do you discover, distinguish recoverable water from unrecoverable water in these projects and, and how were those modeled? Yeah, sure. So for, for the first question, um, looking at trend analysis for changing uh, precipitation or temperature that can be done in, in WEEP. I think there, there was one slide that I showed that, that presented that the integration of the natural systems along with the human systems that, that are represented within the model. Um, WEEP does include uh, a full accounting of the, the hydrology. So that what that means is that if you have calibrated your model in a way that allows you to uh, use precipitation and temperature inputs to evaluate the, the rainfall runoff and the recharge of groundwater, then, then, then you can add in a, a, a future scenario for climate that, that considers these, these trends. And then you can look at the, the impacts of the of changing groundwater levels or changing uh, hydrological regimes uh, under these different uh, future climates. Um, for the, the second question, uh, looking at non-recoverable water, um, I'm not sure that I'm 100% clear on what the term means that, that, uh, in either case. Um, I in, think of maybe around leakage, for example, that goes back into the groundwater or um, evapotranspiration. Yeah, sure. Um, in in Jordan, say we we do have uh, for the this, the water system and the the and the collection of pipelines and canals that are used to deliver water. Uh, we consider losses from those um, really just as, as a percentage uh, based on uh, observed historical information. Um, and that some of that water is, as you say, it's lost to the atmosphere through evaporation, or it can just, it, it could be lost uh, back to, to the groundwater. Um, the, the WEEP model is, you know, is able to handle these things. Um, depending on the, the level of information that's available. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, Camilo, a couple of uh, more energy oriented uh, questions. Um, one question is, um, did we consider looking at options that were less energy dependent, for example, the Red Dead case? And then could you speak to what is causing the sudden increase in energy consumption 
in 2037, 2038 in the Jordan, um, in the Jordan study. So two questions around Jordan and energy. Uh, yes, okay, so to, to answer that, what, what, what we presented here as, as a case, what was the Red Dead desalination project as a scenario. So in this one, this is the, let's say, main driver of energy consumption, but within the project and within the tool, we have other different scenarios as well, which look into different solutions. So this is all what let's, will come together into the visualization uh, um, tool. And for example, we have other scenarios that look into increase uh, efficiency of water productivity in agriculture. And this of course has different energy requirements. And of course, uh, in, in general terms, it, it can even also aid the energy part as if less water is being consumed then less energy will be required for pumping. So all of these differences kind of come um, visible when we analyze all of the diff these different scenarios. Um, and, and, and then one can uh, see basically where are the different energy intensity of a solution against another. Um, the, the increase or the step increase in, in these years uh, in, the, in the Jordan case are mainly due to, to the desalination project becoming uh, operational. So as uh, Brian showed in this um, capacity graph of the energy of the desalination project, uh, first, it starts in, in year 2025 with a, with a uh, let's say, small capacity operational, but in, in around year 2029, it basically doubles this capacity or, or, or triples, I, I don't remember well. So this uh, big step in capacity uh, has a direct impact into the energy system. So it's like uh, passing from uh, desalinating zero and million cubic meters of water to desalinating 100 million cubic water. So this will have uh, energy implications that need to be uh, addressed. Great, thank you. I, um, back to Francesco, several questions coming up around uh, scenarios and it seems like we've really sort of emphasized supply side versus a demand side options. Could you speak to the balance of those two? And then also several questions about to what extent do we consider economics in our analysis in terms of the selection or preference of one strategy or one intervention versus another? Um, yes, thank you. These are very good questions. So we, we tried, uh, first of all, we, we have only presented uh, uh, one or two highlight scenarios. There are quite a few more. So I think there is a, Bit more balance between supply and demand. Um, so yeah, we and, and across the different resources, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll pass it on to Camille and Brian for more concrete examples. Uh, and on the economics part, yes, as as we had mentioned, we are today we are presenting uh, preliminary results, but uh, we are also inserting uh, costing of different solutions and scenarios in in the in the workflow. So maybe can I give it, uh, leave it to Camilo and, and Brian for a couple of uh, more concrete examples on on this on the demand side. Yeah, I, I could speak to the demand side a bit. Um, uh, it both I think both in both cases in Morocco and in Jordan, um, the, uh, the 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 demands are. You know, uh, maybe quite low on a per capita uh, basis uh, is in terms of re relative to, to global standards. Um, and that the, the, the efficiencies, there's, there's probably more to gain in terms of efficiencies on the supply side than there are in terms of gaining efficiency on the, on the demand side, which is why the, the scenario has evolved in such a way that maybe uh, focus more on the supply side dynamics. Great, maybe one, one final question and then we could go to the breakout rooms. I'm gonna um, give this to you, Brian. Um, in the WEAP model, can you speak a little bit about how we uh, simulate climate change and to what extent have we validated and, and benchmarked against observations to, to understand how realistic some of the results are? 
Right. Uh, well, I, I, I think I'll take those in reverse order. Um, the, the calibration process is uh, generally quite rigorous um, and validating the model uh, is, is done against a variety of different metrics, um, starting with the, the hydrology, taking historical observed uh, the climate inputs and uh, 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 creating a, a, a hydrological model that is validated against observations of stream flows at a variety of different locations uh, around a basin or, you know, it, the basin in Susmasa or, um, you know, different wadis in Jordan. Um, so looking at the stream flows, looking at uh, the groundwater levels is another metric that we use to calibrate the model, uh, looking at the, the natural system. When we look at the, the managed system uh, in, uh, for water, uh, we look at uh, the, the levels of uh, water and storage uh, in, the, in, in dams or reservoirs. We look at the amount of water that's, that's been delivered historically. So how is water managed? We're, you know, the, the, the model is calibrated to, to capture those, those dynamics of the, the rules that govern uh, the, the distribution of, and allocation of water based on historical observations. So we, we do generally go through a, a very rigorous process of validating the, the model based on historical information um, and using, trying to focus on the most recent historical data because that is uh, most reflective of what the system is, or how the current system is operated. Um, the first question, which was about climate change. Um, so getting back to the, the, the hydrology, if we have a, uh, a WEEP model that includes hydrology in, where the hydrology is driven by climate inputs of precipitation and, and temperature uh, and relative humidity and, and, and other climate inputs, then it, it becomes an, uh, a matter of replacing those historical uh, observed data that we use for calibrating the model and adding in uh, projections for how those will change into the future, um, which is uh, you, you can have any number of different future climate scenarios that, that can be considered within the model. Great, thank you, Brian. I think um, we have time to do breakout groups. So Francesco, if I could hand over to you. Uh, for me personally, these were, I really enjoyed the breakout rooms last time as a way to get to know some of the people on this call much better and explore some Nexus solutions. 